May 1945. After six long, bloody years, the war is over. If you lived through the 30s as a young man and seen what was going on in Europe and how inevitably there was going to be a war, what sparked me off finally was seeing the hunger marches coming down Piccadilly. I'll never forget it. And uh, I just went straight off and joined the Labour Party. At the 1945 Labour Party conference, a young army major addressed the crowd. The upper classes in every country are selfish, depraved, dissolute and decadent, I cry. The struggle for socialism in Europe has been hard, cruel, merciless and bloody. The seat I fought in 45 uh, was a safe Tory seat. I had no chance to win it. To be honest, my generation, what we wanted most of all, which to prevent war, because wars are started by governments, and unless you run a government, you can't decide whether or not there's a war. Shortly after VE Day, Winston Churchill was forced to call a general election by his Labour coalition partners. It had been 10 years since the last election, and the country wanted its say. Mr Churchill began his four-day election tour of a thousand miles with a visit to the Midlands. Okay. This is no time to, to mince about, to mince measures and fool around. You hear about this Churchill all the time, I said, and then you see him on the, on the cinema. I said, there he is in a boiler suit, I said, and sticking two fingers up, a cigar in his mouth. I said, everybody knows about him. Who's our man, Dad? And he said, he's a man called Clem Ackley. He's very quiet. He's not like this bloke. He says, well, he's got some good people around him. All parties went into battle order with the dawning of nomination day. Mr. Uh, I thought up this publicity stunt to canvassing 10 Downing Street, because it was in my constituency. And I was married to Peggy Ashcroft, the actress. And so we got hold of a photographer, walked as you could then into Downing Street, literally, and knocked on the door. There was a policeman outside, door opened, and I said, I'm the Labour candidate here, I've got my thing on, I've come to canvass the tenant. So he, he looked absolutely aghast, said, the tenant is away at the moment, which was true. Well, I said, I'd like to canvass the staff then. Oh. He shut the door, he came back five minutes later, and there they all were in the hall. So in I went and, and uh, I talked to them and I got a, quite a lot of winks out of them. There was the cook and the butler and the cleaners and everyone. On the campaign trail, the Prime Minister again and again failed to strike the right tone. I think the extraordinary thing about Winston is that he had no understanding of the modern world at all. And I always remember listening to his first uh, speech on the uh, radio uh, and he said, you who are listening to me in your cottages. It was great fun being the avid division of Westminster because it included Soho. Can you imagine anything more fun than canvassing in Soho? Was, <laughs> so that was great fun. From 7 o'clock in the morning to 9 o'clock at night on July the 5th, the people of Britain decided on the kind of government they want. It was the first general election... Unusually, as polling stations closed at 10pm on July the 5th, the ballot boxes were stored away. The forces' vote, scattered across the globe, had to be sent back home and counted. I don't think that anybody in my squadron voted Conservative. Um, certainly, um, nobody owned up <laughs> to voting Conservative, and they, I think they all voted Labour. It was sensational. Three weeks ago or more, when you recorded your votes, very few of you would have prophesied a working majority for Labour, much less one of about 200 seats. 
The news is that there is a big swing to the left. Throughout London and probably throughout... Bevin, Dalton, Stafford Cripps. It was a cabinet of Labour titans, including the new deputy prime minister. Well, my grandfather, my mother's father, was Herbert Morrison. And his watchful eye was trained on absolutely every aspect of the election campaign. And by the way, he did only have one eye. He was blind in the other from birth. Uh, and that one eye drove the entire party election machine. After enduring the horrors of war, the Labour government was determined it was they who should win the peace to create a new Britain. Indeed, nothing short of a new Jerusalem. I mean, when you think about what they did, a national health service, welfare state, council housing, they used to build about two or three hundred thousand houses. Houses, not flats, and uh, each year, and uh, free education. Look how bold they were, look, look what they achieved, you know. Why can't we do more? It was, there was always a kind of, you know, here's the holy grail, this is what a Labour government under Clem Attlee achieved. Um, and these should be our goals. Every party leader since has had to define itself against the legend of 45. And it was a government that was willing to draw on the resources of the whole progressive tradition. As I said earlier, the ideas of Keynes and Beveridge were in part the cornerstones of reform. Attlee proclaimed, and I quote, that the aim of socialism is to give greater freedom to the individual. 1945 is the Labour Party's creation myth. In this, the most nostalgic of British parties, it's a moment to live up to and an eternal litmus test against which to compare the actions of each and every government to follow. Sometimes that burden has been too great to bear. Some say now that the victory's shadow is too long a product from a different age, at a time totally different to our own. Its influence must be cast aside, or at least reinvented. There was an extraordinary moment in 1994, uh, after John Smith had died. Um, it was the 50th um, anniversary of D-Day. There were big commemorations in Normandy, and I went as leader of the opposition. And we had a ceremony in the cemetery at Bayeux um, with, you know, the Queen was there and President Clinton and the Prime Minister and so on and so on. And after the ceremony, um, people broke and there was an opportunity for people to look about the cemetery and to mix informally. And I was mobbed by veterans and their families. And I looked around, I remember looking around and seeing, you know, lots of people around the Prime Minister, of course. Um, and it's not just me who thinks that, because um, the Secretary of State for Defence, who was there, said to one of my colleagues a few days later, did Margaret tell you she was mobbed by the D-Day veterans? And I thought that was for Attlee's government. The Labour Party has faced this with every successive generation that there will always be people in the party who think there's a dividing line between your principles and holding power. What the successful generations of Labour leaders uh, did, starting with Clem Attlee and my grandfather in 1945, was to demonstrate conclusively that there isn't a conflict between those two things. Everyone said in the first 24 or 48 hours after our defeat this year, oh my God, we've really got to think radically and overhaul and realise where we went wrong. Since then, the Labour Party seems to have gone back to sleep somewhat. You know, that sort of awful complacency, that sort of desire not to make difficult choices or take difficult decisions that might be inconvenient for the Labour Party or, or create some tension or division. No, let's leave that alone. Let, let's hope that a new face at the top will simply, you know, get us back to where we want to be. It won't. It won't. You know, you have to think with each successive uh, uh, era, particularly after the spectacular defeat we've just had, you know, what, what new, what different, what improved is required to enable us to win next time. And until and unless the Labour Party faces up to that, as they did God, stupendously in 1945 and again subsequently, until we do that, we won't win. <laughs>